I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No news! Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus. Good afternoon, Bowling Green, and hello to everyone on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe DeMar, and I am not here with my co-host, Rebecca Wood, but uh, hopefully she'll be calling in later. Those of you who listen to the show know she's uh, battling COVID, and you know she's doing pretty well, but she's wanted to spend one more week like at home, wrapped in a shawl with like vapor rub on her chest and stuff. So uh, we'll be hearing from her soon as we craft yet another wonderful hour of radio called For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment. And we talk about them in the ways that they affect you, your wealth, your health, your happiness, the wealth and health and happiness of your friends and your family and your coworkers and the, the butterflies and the bees and the birds that eat them and the bugs that eat the birds and basically everybody and everything because like it or not we're all wrapped up together on this wonderful planet called earth and uh, we've got a good show lined up for you today, today as, as usual, usual. Uh, we're just going to chat for a few minutes here another 10 minutes or so about various eco things that i've observed during the week including uh watching the movie my friend the penguin an interesting film uh, then we're going to hear an interview with a fellow named Ryan Santa Maria, and he is uh, a little bit of a departure for Bowling for uh, Four Green Future. He is with an organization called Property Rights of Ohio, and they're an organization that is trying to protect property rights, especially for farmers that want to put uh, wind and solar panels on their property, and they're being stopped politically by these uh, people that just oppose alternative energy so uh, that's an interesting interview then we'll hear from Rebecca hopefully she's gonna she's planning to call in and if she retains consciousness she'll be talking to us about mangroves uh, then it's ecological news and uh, it's it's a fairly upbeat ecological news this week a lot of a lot of good news a lot of good stuff happening around the world so uh, looking forward to that and uh, hopefully at some point during the show, we will hear from you at 877-909-1007. This is a call-in show, and the whole reason I, I do this show live on radio is to get feedback from you folks. And so we really appreciate it when you call in at 877-909-1007. So I had planned to talk almost the whole first section about the movie, My Friend the Penguin, which is uh, playing live at theaters now. But uh, as I was driving in, I saw a whole bunch of lawn signs here in Maumee saying uh, trapped in Maumee, and they've got this little graphic of some hands sticking up out of water. And I was like, what is that? And I hadn't heard about this uh, controversy before, but apparently there's about 150 property owners in Maumee that got a letter from the city uh, saying that they have to contract to fix their sewer lines, their old sewer lines that have like clay pipes instead of PVC pipes carrying the sewage from their house to the main line. 
and the cost for property owners to do this is somewhere between twenty and forty thousand dollars and so there's a bunch of people rightfully up in arms about this and uh, they've flooded uh pub, you know city council meetings and they're basically they're saying this is crazy and so looking at this from an ecological perspective uh, first and foremost we, we want to keep sewage out of the mommy <laughs> okay that's just a a given in this society now that we know how bad sewage is i mean way back in the 1940s and 50s people could convince themselves that oh it's just you know the plants will eat it, you know, the crayfish will process it and you know, it'll all somehow work out. And we know that's not true now. We know that sewage carries all kinds of diseases. We know that it causes, it helps cause the algae blooms, the toxic algae blooms that happen every year in Lake Erie. Uh, sewage is bad. So we got to start from there. Now, sending people a letter saying that they have 90 days to come up with thirty thousand dollars is also bad you know that's not economically most households in the u.s just can't do that even if you own a home and it is important to note that mommy home values have been going up steadily so so people who live in mommy have houses that are worth a lot more now than they were just five years ago so so there's there's some economic uh ability there but the thing to remember about all this is that this is a, a purely this is an economic problem okay it needs to be solved economically and so there's all sorts of things you can do with money since money can be transferred around money can be it's called fungible you know you can do whatever you want with money basically in order to make things come out the way you want them and so for example uh city of Maumee might be able to work out with Lucas County and make a special, basically try to get a special discount on property taxes for these homeowners that have to come up with this money. Uh, the money could also be, you know, the city could also pool all the people together, find one company to make perhaps do all the repairs. And that way the city could find someone who will do it more cheaply. You know, that's a, a really basic economic principle is, is that if you have a lot of customers, you can charge them less each, you know, in order to make the same amount of profit or more profit. So if like one installation company was doing all the properties, they would save a ton of money on their wholesale orders and they could pass that on. And so you could do it more cheaply than everybody trying to find a retail person and, and trying to come up with the money separately. Uh, there's also an idea that perhaps the city could help by guaranteeing loans with a with a funder, like with a bank. They might Maybe they could find a local bank like Key Bank or maybe even one of our local uh, credit unions. And if the city says, okay, we will guarantee all these loans and spread them out over 20 years, they could get they could negotiate a better interest rate. And so, you know, all these financial things could be done to lessen the impact of this, this huge, you know, you have 90 days to come up with $30,000. Uh, and so doing it the way the city of Maumee did it, which is just, you know, bomb people with a huge bill, uh, kind of guarantees a backlash. And I, I think it is important to note that Probably, I'm guessing that for 90% plus of the people who are upset about this and, and want to fight it, they're not upset about the idea of preventing their sewage from getting into the mommy. Okay, I think we're at the point in the 21st century where most people agree that you just don't dump sewage into the into the river. They're understandably upset about the impact it's going to have on their personal finances, and like I say that's a financial problem and that can be solved financially by people in government and finance with a little bit of imagination and so uh, you know my heart goes out to the, the property owners but the solution to this is not to to say okay we're not going to fix the problem <laughs> we're not we're just going to keep dumping sewage in, indefinitely no that's not the solution but as i said the solution is financial so 
So that pretty much blew my uh, planned <laughs> talk about the, the movie, uh, My Friend the Penguin, which is too bad. I just could have talked a few minutes about it, though, because uh, it was a great movie. You know, it was really nice. Uh, it starred uh, Jean Reno, who's a, a French actor, and he was he, he was, was in, in a bunch, bunch of, of films back in the 90s and early 2000s. Pretty much any film that required a European guy, that's who they would hire, John Renault. Um, he was in like French Kiss and the Godzilla movie and, and uh, Godzilla 2000. Great actor, and he plays a, a fisherman who suffers like personal tragedy and goes into depression for like decades. And then he finds this penguin just floating off the shore near, he's a fisherman, and he brings it in and rescues it. It's covered in oil from an oil spill. And it's about a thousand miles away from where it should be in terms of its annual migration. And uh, it's a basically the, the kind of penguin it is, is a uh, Mag Magellanic penguin. And it traveled from Patagonia, Argentina, all the way up to Brazil. It headed north instead of south. And, uh, but he saves it, he rescues it, and then uh, much to his surprise, the penguin starts coming back to his place and every year in the summer instead of uh, heading and migrating with the rest of the penguins. And, and so it becomes like a national story, it, gets, it goes viral on the internet, and, and he undergoes, and his family undergoes a whole bunch of changes because this is happening, and it's really a beautiful, beautiful movie, both in terms of the, the story and in terms of the photography, because it's filmed on location, a lot of it's filmed on location in Rio de Janeiro, in this heavily forested area in a fishing community. And uh, it's just a gorgeous movie. And it, it's not really a kid film, because even though the previews are all for like kids' movies, which is kind of interesting to sit through as an adult, but um, it's, but it is a, one of those all ages films because a few people brought children. Most of the people there were adults and it was just an absolutely beautiful film. And the reason I found out about it, there's been almost no advertisement for this movie. The reason I found out about it is I'm on the email list for, uh, the, the district of Columbia, the DC environmental film festival, because I went there uh, two years ago to watch the premiere of radioactive the women of Three Mile Island. So now, so now films that are that showed originally in the DC Environmental Film Festival, they send out alerts when they go out to, to the broader audiences. And it's, you know, it's playing at Fallen Timbers all week. I don't expect it to last much more than a week uh, because basically there there weren't that many people in the cinema. And like I said, there's not there's hardly anything in the way of promotion of it. And full disclosure, I'm not receiving anything for promoting it. But it made me think about environmental films. You know, there's a lot of really beautiful movies about nature, about the environment. My favorite one of all times, I talked about this before, is Never Cry Wolf, which was a study of Farley Moat, who went up into the north to basically see why uh, populations of caribou were declining. And the popular wisdom was that wolves were eating them all. You know, it's this idea that you have to control predator numbers. And what his research proved is, no, that's not it at all. The reason they were declining is humans were overhunting them, but the wolves are, just as they have for literally millions of years, the wolves were able to change their own numbers to match the population levels. And so left on their own, predators like wolves will never eat all the caribou, but humans have a propensity to do that. And so the question for the day, if you want to call in at some point, we'd be happy to put you on air. The question at 877-909-1007 is what is your favorite nature movie? Did you have a, a nature movie that has inspired you, that just made you go, you know, nature's really cool. <laughs> so now it is time though, We've got to move along in the show. It's time to hear from Ryan Santamaria from Property Rights Ohio. So go ahead, 
Um, Jared, let's hear that interview. Hello, and welcome to For a Green Future. Could you please just share with us your name and your organization? Yeah, so I am uh, Ryan Santa Maria uh, with Property Rights Ohio, which is a nonprofit that works across the state of Ohio, defending property rights of landowners. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, so what sort of property rights are we talking about here? You know, it varies from case to case. We'll defend anyone that feels that their government is overreaching their hand in restrictions. Um or anything like that. You know, we are a newer organization, so we're still getting our foot in the door in what we're really going out there and doing, learning the trade. Um, what we see the most of, though, currently in the state of Ohio is renewable energy being the forefront of restrictions on property, whether that's solar, wind, battery storage, stuff like that. So that is where currently we are starting in defending the property rights of landowners, specifically uh, ones that are in agriculture, like farming. Right. So yeah, we've we've reported before on uh, essentially the the movement that that has been created. I, I wouldn't call it necessarily a, a something the grassroots movement that's generated by itself. A, a movement that's been created to block wind and solar and so forth. And it's not what <laughs> you you folks I know could talk to you because you had a booth across from me at the fair there. And you guys uh, consider yourselves kind of a conservative organization. Um, but telling people that they can't develop a resource that's on their property, that kind of goes against conservative values, doesn't it? Well, it's, you know, that is one of the things that we stand by is property rights. We believe that's fully protected in the Constitution. And when you look at some of these, especially SB 52 bans that are going into the state, that is restricting the rights of citizens. You know, it's a private deal made between a private citizen and a private entity in most of these cases. But, you know, when you look at anything like that, that's not really a... a partisan issue it's it's a right that we all have if you own property you have the right to develop it if you want to um so you know we look at we can look at politics and discuss the politics of it and we do tend to lean to the conservative side of it but really all energy is a nonpartisan issue when it comes down to it mm -hmm. now the the anti wind and solar movement has kind of got a head start on you folks, don't they? They're they're uh, working in a lot of Ohio counties. Do you run into them? Are, are you having, uh, is this what you're finding as you go around the state? I mean, it's, you'd be hard pressed to find a county or township that doesn't have some sort of uh, local opposition group. Uh, so we see them everywhere, anywhere we go to where we're discussing property rights, we're going to end up running into them at some point. And it is a very strong localized uh, group that goes out there and opposes it. And, you know, it just comes with what's been created throughout the state with uh, some of these restrictions that are allowed to be placed. It empowered groups that want to go out there and oppose this to really put their thumb down um, on any type of local official to say, well, hey, we don't like this. We think that you should restrict it across this county. So it's something you, I mean, again, it's going to be hard to find a place across the state and even in the broader Midwest region to find a place that does not have some of that local opposition that's very strong. Mm -hmm. Now, the ironic thing, of course, about this is that in many, many places, many farms, many communities, uh, wind and solar have turned out to be a, a fantastic uh, benefit, right? A fantastic resource. Um, would you say it's an exaggeration to say that wind and solar have saved farms around the country? No, and you know what we look at and one of our biggest things that we wanna do is defend some of these families that you know, they're aging, they're getting up there in years, and they've had this farm passed down to them through so many generations. 
and eventually gets to them. And maybe their kids or grandkids don't want to farm. They want to go out and do something differently. So when you get up into your 60s, 70s, and farming just really isn't a viable option anymore, having the opportunity to lease your land for solar and or wind, it provides that additional income where you can still, like most of the time, you see people keep a section of their farm that they're going to continue to farm or lease out to someone to continue to farm. And when they have this additional source of income, it allows these very homegrown families that have been there for generations to keep that land and not have to sell it out to a huge conglomerate or even to housing developments in some cases. So it does help support those local families in keeping their land uh, in many, many of these cases. Yeah, and I, I want to focus on that a little bit more because one of the arguments people make that I've run into against wind and solar is that this will take away farmland and, you know, people won't be able to farm anymore. We won't have anywhere to grow crops because we've got solar panels. Is that true or is this what you're seeing or what's your attitude to, on that argument? Well, you know, something, and I, I'm not exactly sure on the specific number, but if we were to theoretically power the in entire state of Ohio just off solar energy, it would take up less than 5% of the productive farmland in the state or something around that figure. It's a relatively small amount of farmland that would need to be used for solar power. So, and it goes back to our messaging, you know, it, we have the food production. We are probably the country that wastes the most food. We have the ability to still farm across the country. But when you put in some of these installations of solar farms or wind farms, it helps consolidate that land as it's still going to be a farm eventually, whether that's the end of the lease or way down in the future. It stops anything else from going in there that would actually take away what it is as farmland, like a housing development. Once you pour those concrete, that land's never going to return to farmland ever again. What this does, it allows the stop of any urban sprawl, and it uh, stops any other form of development or industry from moving onto this farmland. So it, again, it's something that will stop that spread. It will protect it for the land that it is. And yeah, I mean... Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, I guess there's also a move to what they call agrivoltaics. Um, I, I was just in Western New York and saw a solar farm going in on farmland where the panels were actually um, up on poles and they were about, um, I guess it was like six feet high or so, which gives you the opportunity to farm or raise sheep or or do something like that underneath the panels. So you can you can do both. Yeah, and that's something that's still very new. It's um, you know, being tested out right now uh here um at Oak Run, which is a recent project that was uh passed. Um it's going to be the largest agrivoltaics uh solar farm I think in the world and it's really going to be one of those things where you start to see people studying it. I know OSU has already signed on to do studies for how that works and what that looks like as it becomes a more studied, more practiced uh, use of that land. But I, I mean, you're right. It's one of those things that allows the land to continue to be agricultural, at least in some aspect, while also providing that energy. Where Where is Oak Park? Where Whereabouts is that development? in Madison County, I believe. Hmm. That's cool. Ohio basically is kind of lagging behind a lot of other Midwest states when it comes to solar and wind development, right? We Well, we've reported we have a pretty much actively hostile um, state government right now towards wind and solar. But like Iowa, I guess just this past May got 65% of its electricity from wind alone. And Texas is putting out 30% of its power or 30% of the annual wind production that I was happening in Texas and South Dakota gets 56% of its electricity from wind. And so 
it's we have this huge untapped resource and doesn't it uh basically allow you to um the benefits more than the farmer doesn't it because these uh, developments, when they're allowed to go in, they go to the entire benefits, go to the entire community, right? Well, I mean, that's something that we, we do support an all the above approach. We don't think that if you were to provide one source of energy, solar or wind, we don't think that's a smart decision for our grid, but you're right. Doing uh, any type of energy projects, solar, wind, when you're putting that onto the grid, and especially here in Ohio, we are in a region that encompasses like New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York. Our grid is interconnected with all those other states. So as you can imagine, it starts filling up as more people move to these different states, more industry like an Intel plant or a data center comes in. This energy isn't going just to one place. Once it's gone the grid, it's going to anywhere that needs it. An electron doesn't care where it's being produced. It's going to where it's needed. So with, it is an untapped resource, I feel. If we diversify our grid with the addition of more solar and wind, we continue with natural gas and other sources of energy like that, that is going to be the best way for us to ensure that our lights are turning on in the morning or we can charge our phone at night. Mm-hmm. So you folks, like I say, I ran into you at the Wood County Fair, but you're you're approaching this from a very grassroots uh, kind of direction, aren't you? Uh, what kind of reception are you getting? So far, it's been very well. You know, we we are a small or smaller organization, um, so we're just getting off the ground at the moment, uh, trying to build that membership. But so far, we've had a very good reception. I mean property rights is something that it doesn't just affect people that are trying to lease their land for solar or wind. This affects every single person in the state. Um, so, so far we've had a great reception. We have people from across the state signing up to join and the way we see it, we're just going to continue to grow, uh, build out landowners. And that's who this is really about is the landowners who feel like they want to protect their property rights, whether it is for renewable energy or for its, if it's for something different. That is what we're trying to do. And it is grassroots. We're trying to make it about those landowners. We are just the ones spreading the message of property rights. And eventually it's going to be the landowners that are advocating for it. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have any um, like specific examples of farmers or farms that you've uh, worked with that have managed to like get development on their land and what's happened with those people? So unfortunately, the ones that we have dealt with were ones that had their property rights restricted. They faced heavy opposition and were not allowed to eventually lease their land either through uh, SB 52 bans or just uh, OPSB hearings that did not go their way because there was so much opposition. Um, and those are the people that have been very interested from the get-go with us. We have three currently that we are building their stories. So we're going to go get their written testimony video for some of them. And we're going to share those to, you know, people that necessarily haven't necessarily been impacted by it yet someone that maybe hasn't made that choice for their land or even has just considered, oh, maybe that was me, to show just what is going on in this state and how bad it's gotten for some of these landowners that simply wanted to make a choice for their land. So those are the three big ones. I believe it is one in Licking County, Union County, and Mahoning County are the three that are the most instrumental at this, this early stage. It's kind of interesting that the people who don't own the land are feeling really want to control what the landowners can do. I mean, it's it's kind of like a mind mind your own business kind of situation. Why are they so? Uh, they've gotten they've been fired up basically. They've a lot of them are full of disinformation. I've read some of the arguments against wind and solar. Um, this idea that they're they're not recyclable. And of course they are recyclable and, you know, wind turbines can be refurbished and, and solar panels 
90, 90 plus percent, I think it's like 98% of the material in a solar panel could be recycled. And so um, why do you think there is so much uh, opposition? What, what do you see is, is your, when you deal with these people? Well, you know, just as, you know, we believe the right to property is a fundamental right, every single person in this country is entitled to an opinion and their right to speak that opinion. And I think that's what we see is it is the opinion that you cannot like it. You cannot like solar and wind as much as you want. You can put that in papers. You can uh, put that on Facebook. You can even bring that opinion to local officials and to hearings if you want to. But at the end of the day, that's what it is. It's an opinion of, I don't agree with this or I don't like it, but it's the right of that landowner to make that decision for their own land. Uh, we can't make the opinions of people that oppose something the foundation of not letting a landowner do what they wanna do. And that's that's what we see across the state well if people want to follow you folks if people want to um get more information about what you're doing and maybe contact you maybe there's some landowners right now that are thinking about adding wind and solar but are kind of worried because of this uh opposition that's been ginned up how do people follow you so we are on facebook just property rights ohio uh or pro uh, we also have a website, and that's where we uh, ask people if they want to join. Uh, you can go to our website, which is propertyrightsohio.com. Uh, you can sign up there. We have resources there and a little bit more about what we what we do across the state. And those are the best ways to learn more uh, about us. Uh, we can also be reached. It's propertyrightsohio at gmail.com. Uh, you can reach out to us through that as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, our show, we, we come at this from a, you know, an environmental angle. Uh, but I also think it's interesting that at the same time, property owners are being prevented from putting the renewables on their land. There's actually a fair bit of legislation and that prevent people from stopping things like uh, fracking, for example. So people are both being prevented from putting stuff they want on their property and they're being forced to allow things happening, you know, that they don't want to happen on their property. Um, does that also, <laughs> would you say that's a fair assessment too, or is that, um, is that not quite what you guys are looking at? That's not quite what we're looking at. You know, what, what we're really doing is trying to go out there. And when we see uh, someone tr having their property rights restricted, where we want to stand up for them and give them the resources to, um fight anything that is you know restricting that right um and then just trying to combat some of these things that we see going on across the state okay well all right well thank you very much ryan is, is there anything else you'd like to add no i think that 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 about does it all right well good luck and let's hope you guys can protect some of those farmers out there thank you and that was our interview Hope you enjoyed it. It does uh, raise some interesting questions about, uh, you know, the philosophy of what you do with your property in Ohio. Um, it's just kind of interesting that some people are willing to violate like their principles in order to fight something that they just don't like. <laughs> so anyway, but uh, now something we do like are our advertisers and patrons. So let's go ahead and hear from them now. For a Green Future is also brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They also restore wildlife habitats and lead people on outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. There are several ways to get a hold of them and find out what's happening. One is to call them at 419-353-1897. Another is to visit their website, www.wcparks.org. The website, again, is at www 
www.wcparks.org. They are also available on all social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and many others. Just search for WC Parks. That's the Wood County Park District, and we're very grateful for their support. And just a quick reminder that uh, Wood County Park District right now is still looking for a communications specialist. So if you're somebody who maybe is in the advertising or public relations, if you're looking for a job, uh, think about sending a resume over to the Wood County Park District. And our show also is brought to you by our patrons. And our patrons are wonderful people who have gone to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. There they searched for For a Green Future. Up popped our fantastic Patreon page. They picked a monthly membership level that matched their budget. And every month a little bit comes out of their accounts, comes over to us. And that's how we could afford to keep this show on the air. And it really does make a, a tremendous difference having those that support from our Patreon patrons, uh, both financially and more. And you know, in terms of morale, it's it's nice to know that there's people out there that value this kind of programming so much they're willing to put some money up to keep it going. So thank you again to our patrons. All right, so now it's time to talk to Rebecca. Hey, Rebecca, are you there? I am here. All right. So, how goes the battle against COVID? Oh, I just blew some stuff back into my. It's it's trying to morph into an ear infection at this point. Ah, uh, well, hang in there. I hope you hope you dodge the ear infection, and I hope you're back in the studio with us next week. Me too. I, it's looking good. It's looking good. All right. Great. So uh, I wanted to ask you the, the question of the day, which is, uh, what is your favorite environmental film? Hmm. You know, I kind of panicked, and I, but then I remembered Whale Rider, directed by uh, Niki Caro. Whale Rider. Niki Caro. Ah, uh-huh. Yeah. It's, it's about this little Maori girl who, uh, she's sort of the last of her line, and she wants to be a chief, but her grandfather doesn't, doesn't, doesn't it's only supposed to be through the male line and so she has to win him over and there's a whale involved and you know she's huh. sort of trying to help her people and all that stuff it's, it's pretty cool wow. <clears throat> yeah i've never seen it but i have heard really good things about it so I yeah will, i will definitely it, it's a fun movie all right okay so on to your usual segment uh i guess you're going to talk to us about mangroves I am, yeah. A friend of mine went to a veterans retreat in North Carolina a couple uh, last week, I believe it was, and uh, and she wanted to know about mangroves, so I'm doing mangroves. Um, a mangrove, it turns out, I think we've sort of mentioned them in passing before. They're a shrubber tree growing mostly in coastal saline or brackish water. Saline, of course, being salt water like the ocean. Uh, brackish water is sort of uh, some mixture of salt water and fresh water, or it's not as it's not as salty as the one, or as fresh as, as like a regular river. Um, they occur mostly in equatorial climates. Uh, well, I think exclusively actually in the tropics and subtropics, and uh, usually along co- tidal rivers and coastlines. And um, they're, they're adapted to get extra oxygen and remove salt, which is how, how they can do this, which a regular plant, you know, too much salt will kill it, obviously. And um, a mangrove can be a tree or shrub from multiple species that just have all made these ap- adaptations through convergent evolution, which is where... Two things are not related, but they look kind of the same because they've all kind of made the same adaptation to, to the same you know, or similar environments on opposite sides of the world even. But yeah, the um, I think they started around the Cretaceous or so. Um, the oldest fossil of a mangrove palm is 75 million years old. And wow. uh, yeah, they're, they're so old, they, they were spread all over the place by continental drift. Hmm. That's pretty slow, so <laughs> you know that they've been at it for a while, if that's how they spread everywhere. Also called um, halophytes, which include black grasses, and it's just any kind of you know high salt-tolerant plant. Uh, 
People also use it to describe the whole ecosystem that mangroves occur in. There are predominantly, you know, any of the kind of plant that's growing around the mangroves or animal. Um, they're also called mangrove forests or mangal, the, uh, the mangrove biome. And um, maybe a, a saline woodland, the, the biome can be a, a saline woodland or shrubland, usually on a depositional coast lot, coastal region. So it's where a bunch of stuff is washed up and eventually became land. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, like rivers, you know, rivers deposit sediments as they flow. And uh, that, that becomes depositional coastline, like a, like a delta. Um, so, yeah, it's an environment that has lots of fine sediments and high energy wave action, which you'd think would be a recipe for disaster, but it's not because mangroves. <laughs> huh. Mangroves are in there holding it all together and kind of you know, act, acting as an anchor, you know, but the root system holds all that little sediment that's being bashed by the waves together. Um, some mangrove species can handle up to two times the salinity of, uh, salinity of ocean water, apparently, if it somehow they're in an area where the salt's gotten super concentrated. Um, and according to the Global Mangrove Watch Initiative, there are 53,000 plus square miles uh, existing in 118 countries of mangroves environment, um, which unfortunately is a 14, yeah, 14,000 square mile uh, net decrease between 1999 and 2019, uh, mostly because of human activity. So that's not good. Um, yeah, those the pesky benefits humans. of mangroves are. <laughs> but, sorry? I said those pesky humans and their activities. Yeah, lots of activity. <laughs> but yeah, we do stuff. It's kind of what we do. But yeah, um, the, the benefits of mangrove are pretty obvious. You know, you've, you've got this kind of spongy ecosystem, like run through with mangrove roots between you and the ocean. So, you know, that's kind of good. You want anything that's going to soak up tidal waves and hurricanes and that kind of stuff, you know, plus it, it's a great environment for animals and plants of many, many kinds. You know, there's all kinds of nutrients. There's all kinds of places to hide. They love that. That's a nice, nice little safe, safe place for fishy babies and amphibian babies to be born. So uh, mangroves, really pretty important. They're, they're kind of, uh, think of them as like a natural levy, basically. Yeah, cool. Yeah, uh, we we did a story on them. I think it was just last week that they're uh, because of global warming, they are heading towards the poles. In the in the north, they're coming up the coast, and in the south, they're heading down down the coast because it's getting warmer. So, all right, right, that makes sense. Okay, kind of creeping along. All right, Rebecca. Well, thanks for calling in, and you know, go drink something nutritious. And uh, we'll hopefully see you in the studio next week. I need more juice. <laughs> <laughs> see you later. Have a good week, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. That was Rebecca, and her departure opens the lineup. If you want to call it, 877-909-1007. The question of the day, your favorite nature movie. Uh, but, of course, we are happy to talk about any ecological or environmental issue like the uh, trapped in mommy issue. If you're one of those property owners and you want to share your feelings on it, we'd be happy to talk with you. Okay, time now for ecological news. And uh, for our first little bit, we're going to Australia. And there's some good news down there in Australia. So uh, the, the uh, Australia Energy Market Operator, or also called the AMO, uh, has come up with an engineering plan that will result in 100% renewables by uh, 2030 in South Australia grid. Title is uh, on 81624. Title is Australia lays groundwork for reaching 100% renewables with new engineering roadmap. And this was in uh, Renew Energy. Renew Australia. Um, interesting, they've already passed some of the uh, signposts, some of the milestones along the way. <clears throat> Back in December, they had a day where 100% of the demand for the whole grid 
was produced just by rooftop solar. Um, right now, there's so much renewables capacity that they have their what's 99.7% potential available renewables. Uh, unfortunately, because of things like uh, price fluctuations and bottlenecks in the grids, uh, their actual production is, quote, only 72.1%, unquote. But of course, it's important to remember that less than 10 years ago, uh, a lot of experts were saying that was impossible, <laughs> that you couldn't even get to 72% renewables. And now AMO has done the engineering. They're on their way to 100%. The engineering challenges they have to overcome are um, something called inertia, uh, which right now is being maintained by synchronous generators, and that is physical power plants that have spinning generators that maintain that nice uh, 60 cycle per second uh, frequency that you have in your electricity, but they're doing it mechanically. They need to switch over to uh, inverters that do it all electronically, and so they're that's one of their main uh, technical challenges, and they're working on it. And that brings us to our next little story, speaking of working on it in Australia. Uh, again, in Renew Australia on uh, August 12th, the title is China's Goldwing Files EIS for Massive Wind and Battery Project Featuring Biggest Wind Turbines to Date. And essentially what they're doing is uh, they've gotten through the, the process of doing the environmental impact statement for a eight, a one a 1.4 gigawatt wind farm and in addition to the turbines they were also going to have a 400 megawatt hour battery installation it's, uh, it's called the balden wind campus and uh, it features this is one of the reasons this is a notable thing features what are now the largest available wind turbines for on land and that is an eight megawatt turbine, which is just mind blowing because it wasn't long ago, the biggest turbine you could possibly get was one megawatt. Now they're up to eight. So this, this wind farm is going to have 180 of these eight megawatt wind turbines. And to just give you an idea of the size, the, the tip of the blade at the top is 900 feet from the ground. So this is, they're almost as tall as a, like a hundred story building, but that's what we need, you know, that's the scale of engineering that we need to get to 100% renewables. And like I said, South Australia has just committed to going all the way. Another story, uh, another development in the wind industry. This is on uh, eight story on 8.13. And the title is, Heavy Lift Drones Are Now Being Used at Offshore Wind Farm in World First. And there's a wind farm out there in Orsted, owned by Orsted, which is a wind company. This wind farm's in the North Sea and part of the Borsell Wind Project, which is a, not a huge wind farm, it, it, but the, the innovation here is they're using drones to move heavy equipment into up into the nacelles of these wind turbines. And so what they've done prior to this is you have to get a boat with a crane. And if you have to like replace some component or something, you have to literally move your boat from, from turbine to turbine. You have to stop the turbine. You've got to hoist it up there with a the crane. It's this big, dangerous, uh, complicated procedure. And so they've discovered by using these heavy lifting drones, which are about 10 feet across, and each of them can carry about 200 pounds, they can make repairs, they can move this stuff into the turbines 15 times faster than using boats and cranes. And there's no reason, you know, this is an experimental process, but it's been tried before on a smaller scale and it seems to be working great. There's no reason we couldn't eventually scale all the way up to maybe moving the entire nacelle that way. That would be mind blowing if you could just use a drone to just drop that nacelle on top of the tower it would save tons of money and make wind even cheaper and even faster so so that's a nice little development there to, to keep track of and it just shows you what happens when we try <laughs> you know now that we've gone in on wind and solar people keep coming up with innovations that make it faster and cheaper and more practical you know we were held up for 
you know, about 50 years from going into this technology, both by wasting time on nuclear power and, of course, by the fossil fuel industry that didn't want us to make the transition. But now that we're making it, you know, smart people are coming up with great ideas like this. So, unfortunately, now we have to talk about a not so great idea. Um, Joe Manson, Manchin and Lindsey Graham up in the Senate have put in one of the perhaps most deceptively named laws, or they've introduced a bill for the, one of the more, most inter deceptively named laws in, on the books in history. The title of it is uh, Protecting Whales, Human Safety, and the, Envir and the Economy Act. And uh, its number is S1833. And uh, it actually does exactly the opposite. So the situation is that we're down to 360 right whales. They're one of the most endangered whales of the, in the world. And they're up there in the North Atlantic off the coast of the United States. And what this law does, despite its name of protecting whales, uh, what it does is it forbids the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration from creating a rule or rules to protect the whales from the two most common causes of whale death, which are ship strikes and net entanglements. And uh, this was opposed by the mega yacht industry uh, who claimed that, that, caused, that putting in a rule saying boats have to go slower would cost 810,000 jobs and $230 billion, which is complete nonsense. But uh, Joe Manchin and Lindsey Graham bought it hook, line, and sinker, and they used it to justify this law that they're introducing. And literally all the law does is it prevents the NOAA from making rules to protect the whales. And uh, so it's really very deceptive. And, you know, all kinds of industry groups say, hey, this is the best decision ever in the history of decisions. And, of course, they're wrong because, you know, all, all that NOAA is proposing is to slow the boats down. And, you know, if you can't handle that with your mega yacht, if you're not going to buy a mega yacht because you can only go, you know, 10 knots instead of 30 knots, well, well boo-hoo, <laughs> you know. Oh, so sad for you. I, you know, maybe you could spend your billions buying something else like a drone or something. I don't know. So anyway, unfortunately, it's a bipartisan bill and uh, not sure about the prospects for passage, but there's a lot of money uh, behind it. So we'll see what happens. So now, I, but I did promise that mostly good news this week. And so here we go. PV Magazine, August 16th, title, Natron Energy to Build Gigawatt Scale Sodium Ion Battery Factory in the U.S. And this battery factory is going to produce 24 gigawatts worth of batteries every year employ about a thousand people and the, the great thing about this is that these are sodium ion batteries and sodium ion according to this company their sodium batteries perform better than lithium have a higher energy de density they per they work better at lower temperatures because you know if you've got an electric car you know that when it gets cold you really lose a lot of performance apparently not these batteries uh, they're much cheaper. They're like 40% uh, cheaper than than uh, lithium batteries, and they don't require all the environmentally damaging minerals like cobalt and manganese and all these little trace minerals that are being used to destroy. You know, the mining for that is destroying places like the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's the justification for the deep sea nodule mining. But if we switch from lithium to sodium ion, we won't need those deep sea nodules, you know, and it is starting to happen. Uh, and they charge faster. Sodium ion batteries charge at four times the rate. Like I said, they're 40% cheaper and they can be smaller because they have a higher energy density. So basically it's looking like, uh, like Elon Musk's choice for batteries, lithium. Uh, is their, Lithium's days appear to be numbered because Sodium is really widespread and cheap and easy to get. And the way these batteries work is they create ions, which if you have a sodium atom and it's balanced, you know, it has the same number of protons and electrons, 
that's not an ion. But if you take some electrons away, now you have a positively charged atom because there's more protons and electrons. Or if you add electrons to it, now you've got a negatively charged ion, so it's a negative. And once you have a positive and negative, now you can have a battery. All you need is an electrolyte in between them. And so really good news that uh, Natron Energy is building this scale down there in North Carolina. Okay, next. Um, this is a story by Reuters on August 14th, and this was a Reuters exclusive. And it's an anonymous government source, okay? So we have to take that with a, an anonymous grain of salt. But according to this anonymous government source, the U.S. is shifting, uh, and the title is Exclusive In Shift U.S. Backs Global Target to Reduce Plastic Production, Source Says. And so what's going on right now is uh, over in South Korea, there's negotiations for a global ban on single-use plastics. And up to this point, the U.S. has been opposed to the ban. And we've been opposed along with like Saudi Arabia, who love plastic, and China, who make a lot of single-use plastics. And the difference, the key thing here is that we have been pushing for uh, production or we've been opposing production limits and tried to focus on recycling which doesn't work so according to this source we've reversed ourselves and now we support production limits wow okay i'm hearing the music oh, i've got to drop a whole story here just real quick super good news story in ember on august 24th global electricity re re uh, passes uh, renewables equals 30 percent for the first time in history uh there's been more renewable electricity generated in the EU than fossils combined. That's in the first half of 2024. So we're on our way, folks. Do your part. Get your solar panels up. You know, switch over to geothermal heating. Do whatever you can because our government's not doing enough. That's it for this show. Thanks so much for listening. This is Joe Damar, and we are signing off. I don't want no oil, a spoil in my shoreline. I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things, a creeping and crawling. Won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit. Son, don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No, no.